Good morning, Northview Church. Uh, I absolutely love that last song because the sun is definitely going to rise again. And there's times in our lives that we think that it's all gone to pieces and we forget that another day is coming. And that's time kind of hard when we experience those times in our life because as we demonstrated last week, whenever we experience a silence, it can be awkward. And I really tried to pay real close attention to that this week to find more silence wherever I can get that. Whether that would be from cutting the TV off or cutting the phone off. The silence. Last Sunday uh, after church, uh, there was no youth. I thought, man, what, what, we can do something. And uh, so we really didn't do anything. I took the girls. We went up in the woods and um, was walking through there. And I said, like, guys, now listen, if you'll be quiet, we'll probably see some wildlife. And my Caleb bug, she's seven. She's like, I don't know what that is, but I'm hoping we'll see a deer. Like, okay. <laughs> uh, well, the whole point is that we, we, we've got to be quiet. But if you're traveling through the woods with four girls, there's nothing quiet about that. So there's step stomping, you know, on every twig, breaking everything, and I'm like, there's no deer, uh, there's no deer here. There's times that we welcome that silence. There's times that we that we we want the silence in our lives. There's times that we that we welcome it into our lives. That we want just some peace and quiet, and we want just the silence. But then there's other times that we really don't want to experience that, and particularly when it comes to the things of God. And there's times of what we talked about last week that maybe it was us that was trying to hide from God. Like God was still speaking, but maybe it was us that created this silence. And we learned that from Adam and Eve because whenever they sinned and they realized this, they hid themselves from God. And they had this unbelievable relationship and communication with God and where they could just walk with God in the evenings. And I just think that that was just so powerful. Did they have that close a relationship? And then it got broken. And they're the ones who put themselves in silence, not God. And so then, there's times in our life as we, as we pray and as we seek God, like we're trying to do everything right. You know, we're trying to go to church, we're, we're trying to read, we're, we're praying. And there's things that are, that are upon our heart. And as we turn to God and we pray, it's like we get nothing. Has your, any of your parents, has anybody ever told you that they might as well be talking to a wall? My mama has said that to us. Uh, like we were told to clean our rooms or something like that, and we didn't do it. And she's like, it, I might as well just be talking to a wall. So this is my wall. And maybe you've told this to your kids, uh, some, maybe some of the same things. They didn't listen to you, or maybe you didn't listen to your parents or something. Like, I might as well be talking to a wall. Because walls don't talk back. Walls don't listen. They have no feelings. They have no emotions. They can't do what needs to be done. So what your parents are trying to tell you is is that you're just like talking to this wall. And church, have you ever prayed and sought after God and you feel like you might as well be talking to a wall? Have you ever prayed? Have you ever talked to God? Maybe you've even come to church. It seems so sterile that you, even you come to church that, man, I might as well just have talked to a wall. I, I, don't, I don't feel anything. I'm not hearing anything. And this relationship with God almost seems to be skewed because you're not getting nothing. You might as well be talking to a wall. Uh, do you have a prayer in your life that you've been praying about? And he says, like, I mean, you're just not getting anything. Because in, in our age, it seems like it's so hard and so difficult for us to deal with the silence. Because we are so interconnected. We are so connected. We were driving down the road the other day and one of the girls said, there's a phone booth. And again, our seven-year-old, she's like, what's a phone booth for? It's like, well, back in the day, you had to put a quarter in and call somebody who cared and they would be on the other end to answer. And she's like, well, why don't you just use your cell phones? I was like, 
They didn't have those back then. And then she went on about other stuff that we'll not get into, but this phone, you'd have to stop. And they even had these big phone books there so you could look up the number that you were calling. And I'm just curious, if you have ever used a phone booth, would you raise your hand up? A lot of you have. A lot of you have. It really surprised me, but we've used these. So I tried to think when the last time that I used one, and I was probably 19, was the last time that I can ever remember, ever remember using one. 19. That was a long time ago. Because now, we're so connected. Now we carry the technology in our pockets and we can look up and do, and do anything. We're so connected. So when we have this silence in our lives, it's so hard for us to deal with because we're all the time getting a notification. Ka-ding, ka-ding, ding, and we're all the time getting a phone call or a text message. So we're so interconnected. So here's where we struggle with this. We're talking to God. We're so used to be interconnected, and we, we're trying to talk to God, and we're not getting anything. I mean, how, how do we deal with that? Understand all that. Does that mean that God has forgot about you or that he doesn't care about your prayer? We may say no, but yet we struggle with it or we'll stop praying those prayers like, well, God, he's not going to do anything about it. He's not done anything about it yet. See, it's really hard for us to understand this silence and what God does during this silent time. Does it mean that he's not working? Does it mean that he doesn't care about you? I mean, you've got these things upon your heart that you're, I mean, you're praying and you're seeking after God. What do we do during the silence? And we're trying to do everything right. Go to church, we're trying to read our Bibles, trying to do everything right. We're going to look at a man who was doing everything right, and he was really following after God's own heart. This is Genesis chapter 12, and it's a very powerful story. And it starts out with this, this call, this, this call that came to Abram. And he experienced this unbelievable relationship with God. And it starts with verse 1. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, and it says, The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Now, this is this call that came upon Abram. When we spent... A couple months ago, we was talking about this call of God when it comes upon us. This, this call. And Abraham was called. And he was called to leave this land. His family, his relatives, he was called to, to leave this. To this land that he was going to show him. I'm going to turn him into a great nation. So it started out, this is the first indication of a promise from God. That Abram. Abram was going to be turned into a nation. He was going to be the father of of a nation him and through him alone a father of a nation now we know this nation to be the nation of Israel and this nation has been very blessed there's only one catch to this there's only one problem with this and you see this in verse 4 and it says so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him this is his nephew Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran and he took his wife, Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people he had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan when they came to the land of Canaan. He took himself, he took his wife, he took his nephew, and the people that they had acquired. They had other servants. It was his entourage, this group of people. There's only one thing missing. With Abram, one key thing. He had no son. He had no children. He's going to be the father of this nation, but he was missing one key ingredient. No offspring. He had no offspring. But that didn't stop him. He left. He took everything that he had, and he left. And note this. He was 75 years old when this promise came. 75 years old when this promise that he was going to be a father of a nation he was going to leave he was going to go to this country he was going to leave and go to this country going to be the father of a nation this brand new nation God was choosing Abram 
He was going to show and be an example. He was going to show his love through the nation of Israel. And he was going to start with Abraham. But the only problem was he had no, he had no son. He had no children. And he told him this, that I am going to do this. He said, this is going to be this promise at 75 years old. Now, I know that uh, this seems abnormal. That there is a certain normal range of, uh, of childbearing. And I just learned uh, recently that whenever you turn 40, your health insurance, it starts to go down. Because you're past, that's when they consider your past childbearing age. And uh, so I just went and adjusted my insurance and all this through open enrollment. And my insurance is going down. And this lady looked at me. She said, you must have turned 40 this year. I, I did. She said, congratulations, it's going down. And I said, okay, this is, this is good. She said, but we probably need to counter this with some uh, disability insurance and maybe some other stuff. And uh, so now my insurance is now $5 higher because of other things. But 75 years old, you think that this is past. 75 years old, this has moved on. We're thinking at 75 years old, we're into, we're into retirement age. As a matter of fact, he, he should be thinking of retirement right here from procreating, from work. See, God doesn't always think the same way that we do. God had a plan. And he, was gonna, he was gonna bless him and he was gonna make him into a great nation. And Abraham was okay with that. See, when Abraham and, and God talked, there, there was no wall. There was no wall. There was nothing between them and their relationship. There was nothing in between. God told Abraham, and he believed. He went, yep, all right. This is what's going to happen. If God wants to give us a child in our old age, then so be it. He wants us to leave and go to another nation. Again, this open communication, let's go. I mean, could you imagine going up to your wife and say, hey, honey, uh, listen. Uh, God told me that we're going to pack up and leave everything and go somewhere. Great, babe, where are we going? I don't know, but he's going to show us. I mean, that's just not going to fly over well. But yet with Abraham and Sarah, it did. Could you imagine the relationship that this marriage must have had, this communication, how they loved God, this relationship that they had not only with each other, Abraham and Sarah, but between them and God. Church, if you want your marriage to flourish, you both have got to have an intimate, deep relationship with the Creator. God the Father. Because someday your husband may come in and say, hey, God's told us to pack everything up and leave. At 75 years old. She didn't look at him and go, Abraham, you're crazy. God's crazy. No, they left. They left. And in verse 6, it says, And Abram passed through the land to the side of Sechem, to the oak of Moor, at the time the, Canaanite, the Canaanites were in the land. I love this, verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and he said, I will give this land to your offspring. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Here's some more concrete confirmation of this promise. Abram, this is it. I will give this land to your offspring. Your offspring. Your offspring. So this means that Abram, is going to be a father. And not only is he going to be a father, but this marks the father of a nation. And it starts right here. This is it. This is the land. Oh, yeah, it's occupied. So the Canaanites were there. Yes, but it didn't matter. God said, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. Him and God had a unique relationship. And we see this at the end of this part of verse 7. He says, so he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to them. This is very important. Because back then, whenever, as a sign of communication and communion with God, they would build these altars where they would fellowship and talk with God. Almost like in a worship experience, like a very private, intimate worship experience. And this is what Abram and God had. They were that close. Church, I want you to understand that between God and Abraham, there was no wall. There was nothing hindering their relationship. There was nothing between them here. It was open. So much that as they were traveling, as Abram was traveling, leading his family and his nephew, 
leading all this entourage of people and all their possessions, all their belongings, God stops and says, Abram, this is it. This is the land. This is the land that I'm going to give to your offspring. Now, Abram didn't come back and say, wait a minute, God, I ain't got no kids. I'm 75 years old. I'm old. Sarah's old. We old, God. He didn't come back with anything. He just believed God and he built an altar there. And church, we need to understand this about our prior life with God and our communication with God. Sometimes we let circumstances try to have all the details worked out. That doesn't work with God. Because God trumps everything. That means God trumps doctors. God trumps statistics. God trumps everything. And it, even though that this world and everybody may tell you that something is impossible, we already know for, through so much evidence of the Bible that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. So our prior life should exemplify that type of faith, that type of belief, your prior life. God doesn't need you to have everything figured out. He just wants you to believe Him for the impossible. But too many times we try to figure stuff out, don't we? We try to say, oh, it's a sign. Me and Amanda, we've fallen into this trap before, and maybe you have too. That maybe you start talking about getting a new car. Like, hey, yeah, you know, it's maybe, it, maybe it's time. And you're like, wait a minute, did you hear that? This is starting to make noises. It's, time. it's a sign from God. We must get us a new car. Hey, have you seen such and such car? Yeah, and I tell you, if you decide that you want to start getting you a car, you will start seeing them everywhere. They just pop up. Every dealership has got them. They're everywhere. And you may say, it's an omen. It's a sign. It's meant for us to get this car. Because sometimes we try to play God's hand. We try to work it out. We try to do it. <laughs> I think what made Amanda's one of our biggest headbutting disagreements was over a new car. And it almost played into this, and I took a step back. I was like, wait a minute, I don't think this is right. This is not good. She'd already went to the dealer and talked to them, and it was great. We knew the guy. He's like, yeah, you can be in this thing for just such and such a price. And I'm like, I just ain't feeling it. And you can ask her after church. She'll tell you that if we would have went through and bought that car, it would have been the worst mistake because we were at each other over it, over a car. We were trying to, again, try to play and force God's hand. Have you ever done that? Have you try to force God's hand? Maybe try to force something to happen? Maybe try to justify something by thinking, oh, it, it looks good and smells good and maybe we ought to do this. But sometimes we put ourselves in predicaments. See, if you read through here, Abraham and Sarah, they fell into this same trap. Years go by. Years go by. Now, <laughs> we're seeing that Abraham is in his 80s. Him and Sarah are having this conversation. Through this time, God keeps promising a son, keeps promising a son, keeps promising a son. And they're in their 80s now. Abraham and Sarah, they're not getting any younger. Abraham's wife, Sarah, turns and she says, Listen, I've got an idea how we can have a son. I think God's going to bless it. My servant, Hagar, why don't you go ahead and marry her? You can have a son. That way God will give us a son. And Abraham says, Okay. Like, it's never a good idea when you're... It, it, it wasn't a good idea. I don't think that we were meant for sharing. I'll leave it at that. But they, they do it. They do it. And Abram thought that God was going to bless this child. God did but it wasn't the chosen one. It wasn't from his offspring. And they started having this conversation. Again, there's this open relationship between him and God, this open relationship. And he says, no, it's not through Ishmael. It's not through this son you had with his servant. Your wife Sarah is going to bear you a son. Your wife Sarah is going to bear you a son. Years go by. Years go by. Church, I want to ask you right, there, right now at this moment, is there something that you've been praying for for years? Maybe a desire that you have in your heart for years. And maybe you don't have it yet. Maybe you've even stopped praying about it. Maybe you did pray about it a while back, but maybe you've not been praying about it recently. 
Is there a desire upon your heart that you have? Maybe you, maybe you have no idea how it's going to get worked out. Maybe you quit praying about it. Because Abraham struggled. He struggled. He was a great man of faith, but church, he struggled. And you see this in Genesis chapter 15. He struggled. And look at this. This is Genesis chapter 15. It says, after these events. I'm going to stop right there just for a minute. After these events, church, what this sums up is years of agonizing, years of prayer, years of struggling, because Sarah is barren. Now understand this. They were doing their festivities so that she could get pregnant. Do you, you understand me? Like they were practicing what it took to bear children. In church, they did it a lot. In their 80s. It's good stuff. After these things. After these things. I want you to understand. So they were practicing intercourse a lot, this infancy a lot, but at the same time, there was doubt, there was fear. Church, there was prayers. They wanted it so bad, and they, God had this promise. This land I will give to your offspring. This land, but then Abraham, he started to struggle. Look at this now. After these things, the warlord came to Abram in a vision, and he said this, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. So again, there's this open communication. There's no wall. There's this open communication between Abram and God, and God comes up and says, Listen, Abram, don't fear anything. I am your everything. And Abraham is having this time where he's struggling. Because as of right now, he is very old. Now he's in his 90s, and he's looking, he's having this conversation. God came down to speak to Abraham. Again, they had this open communication. And then Abraham, he smarts off to God. Have you ever reacted and smarted off to somebody? Like you said, and as soon as you said it, you knew you ought not had. Abraham does that. Verse 2. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me? What can you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar Damascus? Abraham continued, Look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. He is smarting off to God. Now church, we need to be very careful whenever we start doing this with God. And sometimes we fall into this trap of smarting off to God thinking that there's no way that he can connect the dots, no way that he can work stuff out. We think that there's no way that he can make something happen. But church, is anything too hard for God? And let that question sink in. Is anything too hard for God? Is it? Do we believe that? Do we believe that God can do the impossible? Because here he is smart to go off to God and he said, Look! Look, God, look at my situation. Look at where I'm at. Do you ever do this and have this, this part of this pity party during this? Like God is, it's almost like God went silent on his promise. He just kept promising and promising and promising. And Abraham sees nothing. As a matter of fact, he's still living in a tent. He doesn't even have a house. He's still living in a tent. He's still waiting on this promise from God about this offspring, and he has no sign of it being yet. No sign of it. I can imagine Abraham at this point, in his 90s, seeking that every time, please let today be the day. Let today be the day. Nothing. The same thing over and over. Could you imagine Sarah and what she's struggling with? You've got this promise that's came. This promise has came and you and and Abram, you're you're trying so hard, you're doing all you can physically, you're doing all you can to make this promise happen. And every month, a constant disappointment. Could you imagine her struggle? 
Can you imagine how many times they had to talk with one another? Like, man, we just got to keep, we just got to keep believing God. We just got to keep trusting God. They got tired. And so Abram, he smarted off to God. What can you give me? I mean, God comes down and he has this relationship and this intimacy with Abraham. And he says, don't be afraid, Abraham. I'm your shield. Your reward will be very great. And he smarts off and he says, what can you give me? Do you see the, do you see the shortness of that? What can you give me? He goes on, he says, since I am childless, you keep promising God, you keep promising, and I'm not seeing any results. Sarah is just getting older by the day. I'm not getting any younger. And so he thought he had it figured out. So look, a slave born in my house will be my heir. Church, we do the same thing. We'll start looking around at our surroundings. We'll start looking around at our retirement, our future. and it, Maybe it's not where we're at. And maybe you and your family is not where you thought it, it would be. And we start placing the blame somewhere. God, if you would have just done this. God, if you would just do this. God, if you would have just done this. Not one time do we examine ourselves. Abram here, he's not examine himself instead he's blaming god god what can you give me where where were you at when this promise came to me long before god i was 75 years old when you promised me a child and here i am old even older and still no child church do you ever had this conversation going along with god and sometimes maybe your prayers maybe seem like you're praying to a while not getting anything in return. You're praying, you hit your knees, you call out. And when you're done and you close out your prayer in Jesus' name, all you get is silence. No answer. No hope. The same thing over and over and over. So what do we do? Abraham is having this same struggle, examining his life where we're at. In church, we do the same thing. We examine our life and our kids and our future, our finances. And we're like, God, where are you at? Where are you at? I, I thought you loved me. I, I thought you cared. Look. Look at my family. Look at my kids. They're struggling. L look at my job. It's terrible. God, look, look at our house. It needs all these repairs. And we say this as if God doesn't already know. Church, you don't ever have to ask God to look upon your situation because God is the ultimate looker. Is He not? He has got the most perfect view. He's got the most perfect seat that He can see all. And he knows all about your family and your struggles. God is the ultimate looker. You don't have to place it out in a platter before him. He already knows what you're going through. He knows exactly your situation. So then what do we do? Well, if God is the ultimate looker and knows our situation, then what do we do? What, what part of this do we play? Well, here is what God calls out. Verse 4. He says, now the word of the Lord came to him. This one talking about Ishmael, the illegitimate child, the one that he didn't promise. He said, this one will not be your heir. Instead, the one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside, so he was in the tent. He took him outside the tent, and he said, look at the sky and count the stars. If you're able to count them, then he said, your offspring will be that numerous. Your offspring. Church, God will not stop on his promise. He will see it through. It may not be in your time or the way that you wanted answered it. See, here's where, here's where we struggle because we build a house of cards and I want God to bless it. And Abraham and Sarah did the same thing. They built a house of cards and it did not fall the way they thought it would or should. God doesn't need your help in figuring out the plan. 
He needs your faith. That's all he needs. He just needs you to believe him for the impossible. He said your offspring will be that numerous. It seemed like that in the fall and the winter time, and I'm not quite sure why, I'm sure there's some scientific explanation about it, but it just seemed like the stars seem to be brighter and more of them. And uh, now that it gets dark, you know, at 5.30 or whatever, I'm outside a lot because letting the dog out and playing fetch. Or, so I, a lot of times I'm looking at the sky. And I'm reminded of this promise. And sometimes out of foolishness, I just try to see just in a circle how many stars I can count. Have you ever tried? Just in a circle. You can't do it. Because the more your eyes focus and the more your eyes adjust, the more your eyes get used to the darkness, they just keep popping up. And then I go, wait a minute, did I count that one? And then I start all over. He says, Abram, your offspring will be that numerous. Your offspring. Your offspring. Church, God has promised that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll go with us all the way. He has promised that He will bless us. He has promised that He will not forget you, nor your struggles. That He has prepared... He loves you so much that He even prepared a way for you. This is where Jesus came in. He loves you that much. So then what about all the stuff you've got going on in your life, and you're praying, and you're praying, and you're praying, and all you get is a wall. Silence. What do you get? What do you do when you've got these desires upon your heart and you've prayed? You have prayed. And even called out to God and said, God, look at my situation. Look what's going on here. And still yet all you get is silence. What do you do? Well, here, God calls out Abram and he says, listen, this is not the way it's going to go down. The way you have got it figured out is not... You will have a son. You will. You will. Your offspring is going to be this numerous. And if you look at verse 6, here's what Abram did. Verse 6. And Abram believed the Lord and credited it, him to, credited it to him as righteousness. He believed. He believed. What do we do? Whenever we've got these desires of our heart, I'm talking about some heartfelt desires. What do we do when we've got these desires and we prayed about them before, but we're getting nothing? Church, we keep praying and we keep believing. God is faithful and He will come through. We need to pray. We need to believe what we're praying about. Do you have a great big prayer of faith that you need to be praying Something, something big. Something big. Maybe you prayed about it once before, or maybe you prayed about it in the past. I thought maybe it's time for us to put this back on the forefront where we believe it and we pray for it every day. Every day. You know why every day? Because Abram had to wait 25 years for this child. How long have you waited for those prayers of your heart? Have you waited 25 years? I've never prayed over something 25 years. I never have. So 25 years for me, that means I would have been 15. Have you prayed a prayer for 25 years? Church, he's asking us to be faithful, to keep praying and believe. Abraham, he said, okay. He believed the Lord and credited him as righteous. Now, he still struggled. He still had doubts. And sometimes we do. I think this is the human part of us. Sometimes we wonder, like, God, I have no idea how you're going to do this. I just believe you're going to. I think that's okay. Because God is so big. He's so far above us. I have no idea. I just know that he is God and I am not. I mean, we're talking about God now who spoke to dirt and made a man. When I speak to dirt, I get dirt, but not God. God can take your dirt, your pile of a mess of a family, and can bless it. It's time for us to believe it. 
I'm talking about believe God for the impossible, whatever it is. He can bless your mess. He can bless your dirt. Church, he's done it too many times. <laughs> All he's asking for you to do is believe him. Church, are you ready to pray and believe God you may get done praying, and you may not hear the angels singing. You may not hear any bells. You may not feel any presence whatsoever, because the, that is not what this is about. It's about you believing God. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. He believed. He believed. He's just asking for you and your faith to believe. To believe. We already said God is the ultimate looker. He knows your situation. He knows what you're going through. Church, the question is, are you ready to believe and pray? Sometimes we fall guilty of falling to the trap of trying to do stuff with ourselves. And we, there are times that we do need to put feet our prayers it's like with Abraham and Sarah and they keep asking for a child and asking for the child but them not doing intercourse for it to happen and maybe there's some things in your life that, that you can do that things that you need to do things that you need to already to work out like I don't think that we need to pray about certain things like, I don't think you need to pray about feeding your kids feed your kids but there's some deep matters of our heart that I think that it's important that we believe God and that we pray. And I don't know what it is that you've got going on in your life or your family's life, whatever it is that you might be experiencing. But I think it's time that we believe God, even for the impossible. You don't have to have a, a way figured out. Let God take care of that. But if you've got these desires of your heart, I'm talking like deep, down desires that you need God to move in your life whether it be a healing whether it be marriage whether it be your, something with education or work related whatever it may be church I think it's time that we believe and give that to God there's people in my life that I want to see saved and sometimes I, I fall into the trap that I've been praying and praying and praying and prayed so much that I quit. Is there somebody in your family, in your life, that you want to see saved so bad? Do you believe that God can save them? Then we need to pray. Church, I'm coming to a close with this. If you've got a desire upon your heart, then I encourage you to bring it to the Father. That you just believe and bring it to the Father. Say, God, I pray for such and such. God, I pray for so and so. God, I pray for my family. God, I pray for my marriage. God, I pray for my kids. God, I pray for so and so who has an addiction. God, I pray for these finances over here. God, I pray for this education over here. God, I pray for even my own health. Church, is there something, a desire of your heart that you need to pray about? A desire upon your heart that you want to see God move and work. It doesn't matter if anybody thinks it's impossible. God has defined, He just defied all possibilities. Because if God can speak to dirt and make a man, I think He can touch the desires of your heart. I think He can touch where nobody else can. As you examine the Bible, you can see that God can heal when doctors can't. That God can revive when others say there's no hope. God can restore what's broken. What we need to do is believe. We're going to take a time a moment for you to give stuff to God. Daniel's going to cut at our lights. I'm going to ask if you would for y'all just to please stand where you're at. Just to please stand. 
And you won't be standing long, just for a moment. And you're going to hear some music playing in the background. And right now, this is your altar call. Whatever it is that's upon your heart, I want you to stand because now you're almost there. Would you join me in prayer right now? Father God, we love you and thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for your word. God, I know that it will not return void. And this morning you have spoken really passionately and intimately about deep things in our heart. And right now, God, we pray that through the presence of your Holy Spirit that you'd search us out in this room. And God, you'd reveal yourself in us. And that at this time, we'll respond to your word that's been spoken to us. As you continue to pray and to seek God, right now, this altar is open. There's desires heavy upon your heart, a desire upon your heart that you want so bad for you or your family, for yourself. I encourage you right now to come down to this altar and give that to God. Just talk to the Father just as Abram did. I ask for everybody to be standing because now you're halfway there. If there's a desire upon your heart, would you come and give that to Him, whatever that is, whatever that looks like. There's nobody looking around. This is between you and God. There's some already coming. And if you feel that in your heart, you feel that tug, you feel that. Church, I'm telling you, that's, that's the Father drawing you to Him. you got a desire upon your heart, would you come? You've got, you've got a need. You've got something you want God to move so much in your life. I'm telling you, just would you come? You want somebody to pray with you? We'll pray with you. Would you come? Church, there's many coming. I'm telling you, if God is drawing you, would you come? Respond to Him. If you can't get down on your knees right here, there's a first, there's this pew right here that you can come. You can sit down. And we're just asking you just to come and give that to God, the desires of your heart, whatever that is. Those prayers, those needs, whatever that may be. Just come and give that to God. Would it be others? Whatever that may be, would you come and give that to God right now? And just ask you to come. Maybe it's somebody in your family that's lost. Maybe it's somebody that needs Jesus. Well, maybe you want to come and give that name to God. You want to come and, and lay that down at this altar. Would you come? Maybe it's your marriage, your family. Would you just come, give it to God, whatever that may be. There is no shame in the altar. This is the part that's glorified. We're talking to the Father. And if He's drawing you to come to Him, then I'm asking you if you would to respond and come right now. Would you come and commune with the Father? some of you here today and maybe you've got some stuff going on in your life we'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you you got something going on in your life that you, you just you just need to be uplifted this morning pray. and we have the opportunity to pray for you would you just raise your hand up and say hey would you, would you pray for me yes others hey I'll just pray for me God you see these hands and they represent your children God, we uplift them to you. And we pray, God, in a mighty, powerful way that you would move in their lives. God, that they would experience you the way Abram experienced you. This close, intimate relationship where we could walk with you. God, we pray that you'd bless them in the situation they got going on in their families, in their lives. God, we pray for wise counsel that they'd be able to seek after you and do, Father, what you want done. May they be a lot under their family. May they be able to point people to Jesus just by the way that they live. If you're here today, you've got somebody that's lost in your family, somebody that needs to be saved, we're going to pray for them. I'm going to ask you if you would, if you just raise your hand up and keep it up. If you've got somebody in your family that needs Jesus, somebody that's lost, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand up and just keep it up. We're just going to pray for these people. I want to ask if you would just to raise your hand up and keep it. If you've got somebody that needs to be saved in your family, we just want to pray for these, that person you're talking about right now. Would you pray with me right now? Father, we pray for such and such. Would you lift their names up right now to God?
call their names up to God. God, we pray for such and such. Oh, God, they, God, they need to be saved. They, they need Jesus. God, we up with them to you and pray that you prepare their heart to hear a word from you. God, we pray, Father, that you would touch them in such a way. God, that they would know that it's you that's calling and respond to your call. And help us, God, to be your hands and feet. That we might be able to point and direct people to the Father. We up with these people, God, to you that we love and that we care about. Prepare their hearts as you call them out. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the word and what you've spoken here today. And we thank you, Father, for knowing exactly what we need and when we need it. God, I'm so glad that we can experience you here in a worship setting. We can experience you in such a powerful way. And it's great in this worship experience that we all get to come and experience and be a part of it together, corporately. But God, I thank you that we can also hear you in the whispers and the beauty of your creation. As we drive down the road, as we see the leaves, as we see the sunsets and the sunrises, as we hear the laugh of a child, as we see the hard work of the parent, God, we're so thankful that we can experience you outside of these walls. And our communion with you, our fellowship with you doesn't have to stop today. That we can fellowship with you during this week. God, may you bless our music and our ears, what we hear. May we seek you with all that we have. So that when you call on us, when you call on us and you want us to leave, you want us to, to move in a certain way, you want us to go down a certain path. God, may we have the integrity of Abram and the boldness and the faith to get up and to go wherever you're leading. Father, I pray for every marriage here, every family. Oh God, would you bless you. Satan seeks to destroy it, but you're not done. Father, would you bless it? God, I pray that you bless every parent here. I know it's tough. I know that it's hard. God, bless them. Give them the fuel and through the guidance, God, of your Holy Spirit, may they be the best parents that they can be. Father, we have kids to the left and to the right of us, and we just, God, we just pray for all these kids. God, that you may bless them and help us to do our part in showing them and pointing them to you. Father, we pray for this nation and its future, wherever it is that you're leading it. May you bless its leaders. pray that you bless the families, God. We thank you for our church, God, and all your churches around. God, that you would bless them, set us on fire, God. That we'd be your witnesses no matter where we go. And that even though that we may experience some times of doubt, fear, frustration, God, we're going to hold on. We're just going to believe you because we know that you're not done. Father, we love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take a moment, give God some awesome praise. God, I love you so very much.